My question is directed to Dan Ventura. And uh, thank you for your presentation. All of your presentations are very good. Um, yours was actually uh, very fraught with lots of controversial stuff. But one of the things you did point out in your um, discussion was what you consider to be a strength of artificial intelligence systems or computer systems, one of which is that they don't get bored. And I would like to ask your opinion about the fact that maybe that's a weakness, not a strength. In that I think that boredom is a huge motivator for human intelligence. And also, I would like to also kind of just the panel in general, if they want to take it on, that we probably need a more concrete definition of intelligence that's based more upon uh, alignment of goals and values with action and not just um, you know, able to solve nice puzzles. So uh, I think intelligence is more along that line than along some of the lines that we hear and discuss over the past several days. Thanks. Thanks. Um, uh, your point about boredom is really good. I only meant to say I think it's good that they don't get bored in the context of the incubation step. In other words, um, if incubation can be affected by just trying everything there is to try, or most everything there is to try, or try to make all the connections you might make in the background knowledge that you have, for example, then humans aren't very good about that because they just get tired. They don't, they don't want to keep thinking about it, and they wander off and get lost. And I suppose that might be a good thing too sometimes, but at least in the, in the case of trying to do some sort of brute force search, it's good to not get bored, and it's bad to get bored. Um, in, in the more general sort of intelligence question that you raised afterwards, I think you're exactly right that boredom is uh, a good thing for humans and drives them to do things they wouldn't otherwise do. So I, I completely agree with you in the broader sense. As for uh, a definition of intelligence, well, we've been working on that for 60 years. So, so how can we code boredom or the the desire to avoid boredom into an AGI system. How can that be put into an algorithm, so to speak? Yeah, that's a good question. How can we, how can we encode the, the avoidance of boredom into a system? Um, I think Schmidt Gruber's actually talked about that a little bit in some of his work, and probably other people too, but that's the one I, I, I think of just when you ask that question. I'll let somebody else say something about the intelligence stuff. If you want. <laughs> yeah, I basically agree with my supervisor on the definition of artificial intelligence, which seems like the smart ass to do. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we all have uh, sort of our own working definitions, and for me, uh, intelligence basically enables a system to, uh, to learn a wide variety of, of things and to basically accomplish many different tasks. But I do agree with uh, Dr. Wasser that um, the failures are really important, although I have to admit I don't fully, uh, didn't fully grasp the difference between goals and failures. I guess I might phrase it more as intelligence is the art of state navigation, um, getting yourself you know, to a given helpful state avoiding negative states, um, and just building capabilities in order to improve your state navigation. I mean, you, you know what experience is good, or self-knowledge you must accumulate to learn what you'll find is good, and then you need to develop abilities and foresight and everything else to get to good states. But, you know, presupposing that a given state is good, you know, being inflexible about it, you know, all those things that you get when, you know, you start with the goal seems to be the opposite of wisdom, if not intelligence. Uh, I'll just say that probably if a lot of people have spent a lot of time trying to define something that can't, it's because it doesn't exist and one is better off spending one's attention on more uh, concrete goals. It's not more of a pragmatic pragmatist. I don't really care to make definitions about uh, abstract nouns. So a lot of the questions of, of goals and, and values, and you talked about uh, 
goals in a way that I thought you meant maybe very specific goals that an agent is trying to uh, reach or uh, achieve, uh, do some task well, or something like that. But there are also, uh, in, in my camp, there are uh, people who care about a kind of uh, very long-term goal, which is just understanding the world around us. And this is not uh, oriented towards a specific task. Any kind of task that will come in the future, if we do a good job of understanding everything that comes to us, will be well equipped to, to deal with. Um, so it, 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 it says nothing about values and so on. That was an interesting piece. But, but regarding goals, there are short-term goals that are very specific to uh, maximizing our rewards. And there are very long-term goals where you say, well, I don't know what the future is going to bring to me. So, I'm going to try to pull out as much information as possible from what I'm asking. There's a distinction between terminal goals and instrumental goals. And it sounds as if your long-term goals, for the most part, are developing your capabilities and advancing your other instrumental goals to prepare yourself for whatever terminal goals you need to you know, achieve immediate states or avoid immediate bad states. Yeah, uh, so what's wrong with that? <laughs> there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. In fact, I argue that basically values are those things which promote instrumental goals. I mean, you want to be able to survive, you want to be able to learn, you want to be able to, you know, collect resources. All of those things are valuable to us. You know, we want to make it so that we're in community with one another. Um, our value system, in one sense, is very simple at root, but only seems very complex when it's reflected against a very complex environment. So this, this is a sort of uh, long-standing discussion between Mark Wasser and myself on, on, on these issues. And I, I, I share with him being basically an optimist about the likely impact of AGI on human beings. I, I don't really think AGI is likely to give rise to the Terminator enslaving us all or the Matrix turning us into batteries or something. I mean, we can, we can never really know what, what's going to happen, but I think it, it, it's, it's fairly likely that AGIs, as they become smarter than us, will, will coexist in some way. But still, there, there was a certain part in, in Mark's slides that made me sort of scratch my chin, which was the part about uh, consensus human value systems. Because when, when I look at the world today, I really don't see much of a consensus human value system. So actually, I wanted to first put the question to the audience. I mean, how, how many people feel like there is a significant, meaningful, useful consensus value system binding together, say, 99% of human beings on, on, the, on the Earth today? So put up your hand if you think there is. Oh, I, I don't know if you could phrase it in a different way. Okay. Uh, not 90%, not 90%. Right. Or, or, I, well, I could actually phrase it very differently because... You can give, give it your own phrasing. Please. One of the problems currently is we've gotten far too much into dilemma mode. You know, everyone basically knows the pillars are generally considered to be good. And the real problem comes about when you're making trade-offs between pillars, you know. For instance, you know, people who you know, prefer life over freedom in the case of abortion, but then turn around and prefer freedom well, over I, life I, I, in I the case of gun control. Value system, but as, as, as one example, but, but I mean, my point is, is that you know, those are where the trade-offs are unequal, but not the value system. Well, I think I mean, the uniform value as Mark, system is the one, one, as one quick example, for example, the majority of Islamic people, not to pick on one, one particular discipline, but I happen to have a family member who's converted to that religion, so I've become familiar with it. I mean, they believe that homosexuality is bad. If you have a son who's gay, you should disown them. And there's a large swath of people who, who do believe that. I, I don't believe that. So what's the consensus human value? It seems 
In to me, to me, hard to define. In group loyalty, in suppression of differences. So is there a specific example of that? And it's a specifically unhelpful example of that, but it's something that we all share. So the, abs the general values are at a pretty high level of abstraction, and then which I'm not sure how useful values that level of abstraction are, because we could have an AI that agreed with the value of the level of abstraction, but in every concrete instance, it's something that was important to you. Well, but some of it is that you have to determine the circumstances under which given values are useful, and the circumstances where they're evolutionary overshoots. You know, sexuality is extremely important to human beings, you know, that's why we stomp, you know, so hard on differences. Yeah. And it's really not helpful in this day and age to do that. But since it's a difference in a matter that's extremely important to us, you know, we accept the evolutionary overshoot and you know we go crazy with it. Okay, the ethic has a large body of discussions about universal ethics or a basis for universal universality in ethics and basis of discourse in ethics. But uh, to me, with respect to AGI, this seems to be all a little bit moved. Uh, it seems that this is a discussion that is done by a panel of chimpanzees with respect to the future development of mankind. And uh, it's absolutely inconsequential because it has no causal effect on what the humans are going to do once they take it over the planet. And uh, I just don't see how you can meaningfully come up with it Institute uh, that does uh, uh, anyway think about moral requirement for AGI and not call this anything else than Chimpanzee's Institute of Wishful Thinking. <laughs> so I'm not sure I understand. I, I maybe uh, an answer to that. I'd really like to say um, I don't know if it's better. I think maybe it's worse than that because I think I think the, the operational assumption here is that we once we build machines that are generally smarter and more intelligent than ourselves then we'll have to start worrying about a scenario like the Terminator. I, I don't think that's at all necessary. I think if you have um, uh, some quadcopters and other kinds of vehicles with, uh, if there's big improvements in battery storage, these things can stay aloft for hours or days at a time and they're weaponized and they have really good um, image recognition and, and sort of pretty fast reasoning. Um, they won't look anything like us. We won't be able to converse with them. But nobody would confuse them with being intelligent, but they'll be deadly and dangerous as hell. And they could bring that out and to civilization if they're engineered that way. So, I mean, I, I think it's, I have kind of a, maybe that's a really pessimistic view. I mean, I think if you just want to look for destruction, I don't think you need anything like AGI. I think you need kind of the direction that we'll, we'll probably be at in a few years without any major breakthroughs, which is maybe some incremental improvements and things like, uh, you know, something as mundane as battery storage and maybe better, uh, you know, better version of OpenCV or something like that. Uh, actually, I think this is a very interesting point that you brought up. Um, to relate this back to the point of affordances and uh, the way uh, that we would share the fact that environment with other intelligent beings. I think that the jury is probably still out because this, uh, I think the position that uh, the, there is no way to uh, meaningfully communicate over those boundaries between different types of intelligence and different kinds of embodiments uh, is very radical. And there might be a meaningful uh, overlap that is large enough to allow for a translation. Uh, but um, I, for me, the main problem seems to be uh, in the moral component. Because uh, human morality uh, does not necessarily have any consequences uh, beyond humans. And uh, even if we could agree on uh, universalist morals with respect to humans, uh, I do think that there might be something like a basic consensus, but this basic consensus is not necessarily live and then live, even among humans. It could also be a very competitive consensus, the conservative um, uh, position that we could have. And uh, so even if it's possible to communicate, if that were the case, which is not clear, uh, and even if uh, there is some kind of, say, neuromancer aspect that is able to emulate human um, um, mentality uh, to a large extent and is willing to uh, be empathic uh, towards it and interact meaningfully towards it, it doesn't mean that the overall morality is in any way commensurable and that it makes sense that we now try to think about morality of systems 
that uh, are probably not bothered by our uh, thoughts about the matter anyway. Morality fundamentally is about what's required to stay in community. I mean, human beings are obligatorily gregarious. You know, we have to exist in community. We don't survive by ourselves. Um, you know, one of the questions is, what happens if you come up with an entity that can be a loner? There's great power and diversity. Um, monoculture is effective, efficient, but when your environment changes, when you have to do different things, diversity is extremely worthwhile. And I think there's a major advantage to, unless the situation is incredibly dire, I think you want all the diversity that you can get. And I'm not so concerned that AGI are going to absolutely need every single resource that they can put their hands on. I think they'll value a lot of things, including the fact that in the longest term, diversity may trump anything. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to point out that uh, some people are trying to use their creativity to formalize ethics. And I, 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 I find the discussions of, of, of consistency between ethical systems or codes to be a little bit premature. Uh, if we don't have the math done, it's pretty hard to say something's uh, in, inconsistent. So I'm just trying to make a connection between a number of the themes that are, that are on, the, uh, on the table. And some people are trying to apply those formalizations to robots uh, or to AI agents. So that seems to be a point, potentially, a nexus between how those people. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to comment on uh, Ron Ark and Anthony George Attack actually has published quite a bit saying that uh, we really should endow um, robots uh, in combat with the ability to, to, to make their own decisions whether to fire or not because we have reason to believe that they'll make more ethical decisions that aren't afraid of themselves of being shot at and they won't shoot at somebody in anger or retribution, right? And again, I would make the point that, you know, the technology for that pretty much exists. It's a matter of actually implementing. We don't need something like human level intelligence. Um, and as far as, I would just say, as far as ethics, I mean, one, you know, just to bring in a big and shiny and turn on this, the fact that we can say something like we haven't discovered the map yet or we're working on the map doesn't mean that there is a map and that we'll ever discover it. Um, and that, not to pick on your, your particular phrasing of this, but I think in general, sometimes with these kinds of talks, I get the sense people think that everything's an engineering problem, right? And I think what Wittgenstein showed is that a lot of what we think of as an engineering problem is a problem of language. Like, words, uh, we need a definition. Now, I don't, I don't not believe, not believe, I need a definition of intelligence. I don't believe it's a clear notion. So I think a kind of radical position in that respect. I mean, one, one needs to be mindful of whether one is, is, is sort of treating um, essentially ill-defined, ill-posed um, metaphysical problems as, as if they were engineering problems. I think that's a real risk in this kind of thing. And so I, that's why I try to work on actual concrete things. Um, you know, working yeah, robotics what or what definitions are concrete. Or analogy. Yeah. What definition is a uh, an honest attempt at being concrete? So, so you're saying you're trying to work in concrete things, but you won't make any concrete statements or no. I'm trying to make concrete. Oh, like, you know, get 12 percent improvement with, with with speech recognition. That seems worthwhile to me to do, but I don't. I don't see any value in, in, in engaging in my physical task of saying, well, we need a definition of intelligence so that we can build an intelligent artifact. I mean, I, I, you know, I frankly think that, that so much effort has been spent on that by philosophers and, and, and cognitive scientists and, and AI people that if, if such a thing were possible, it would have been done already. The reason that we haven't is that it's And in a way, I agree with you, but yeah. sometimes we have to step out there and say, well, this is what it is that I'm trying to do. In other words, he um, asked the question very clearly, what is it that we want? What do we want? And I don't think um, if you don't say what you want, what you're trying to do, you're not going to get anything that's going to... I think satisfy maybe what, what you subconsciously are looking for. Well, but I mean, you could have a practical goal, like make, make a robot that can graduate from MIT following the same exact procedure as a human being. Then that, that doesn't require a formal definition of intelligence. There's an X prize That's out. a pragmatic definition of, of intelligence, which probably is more useful and will convince more people to make it something that fulfills some mathematical formula or philosophical definition of intelligence. But that pragmatic definition of intelligence is exactly what I'm saying we should have. That's not a definition, that's not being taken as a definition of intelligence. It's being taken as okay, a... Maybe we should take this discussion sure. online. Sure. <laughs> if you don't want to have a last question, then we go for a uh, I guess it was not a question, but a comment. Uh, first, regarding the, the chimp example, uh, we're different from the chimps because we are designing the next generation. And uh, maybe there's a possibility uh, to bring ethics in a very simple way into the portrait if we consider 
the option of building machines that are intelligent but don't have an ego, in which case they're just like Google search but you know through Power 1000, and they're not trying to uh, you know uh, promote themselves. Um, and, and, and you know I don't know if this is, this is reasonable, but at least it gets rid of the ethical problem. Of course, maybe people. But it's the hands of people to decide to do that or to endow a machine with an ego or not. I think an egoless machine is going to end up with a severe case of frame problem. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know what you mean. That, that sounds a bit like, I mean, as if, you know, Asimov flows a robotic to the entire sort of um, iRobot, you know, sort of a collection of short stories about why when people try to do that, you know, to make the robot sort of egoless and benevolent, that it, it always ends up being, it's almost like these comic pun misinterpretations and it does something really horrible and runs them up, but it really is following the law. So um, I agree with you and I, it, I think it's very, very difficult to formulate those kinds of things in, in a way that won't lead you into either the frame problem or uh, under the law of unintended consequences. Okay, so let's end the moderated discussion here. Uh, let's thank the speakers again.